Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us, and welcome to today's webinar titled The Journey from Pandemic Teaching into the New Normal, featuring Dr. Gethin Evans. As the fourth webinar in this four-part series, he will discuss his experience teaching in the life sciences pre, during, and post-pandemic, and how his department has invested in technology to enhance teaching content and delivery. I wanted to take this moment to thank our sponsor of this event, AD Instruments, for making it all possible. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome Gethin to join me. Hi, Gethin. Please take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks very much, Sydney. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the introduction there, Sydney, and thanks very much for, to everybody for, for joining me uh, this afternoon for this talk. Uh, good afternoon, as it is here in Manchester, UK. It's very rainy here. I hope it's a little bit better where, wherever you are. Uh, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank AD Instruments for the invite to, to come and speak to you uh, today. Uh, the point of this talk is, is for me to talk through uh, our journey uh, here at Manchester Metropolitan University in the Department of Life Sciences in particular, uh, from where we were before the pandemic to how things were during the pandemic and ultimately where we're moving to over the course of the next few years. And hopefully you'll see from this that we've gone on quite a journey in a relatively short space of time. Uh, as Sydney said, my name's Gethin Evans. I'm one of the deputy heads of the Department of Life Sciences here at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, and one of the things I'd just like to, to make clear but at the start of this is that while I'm doing this presentation, I'm presenting work and, and a lot of work actually that's been done by a lot of people other than myself. Uh, I've been heavily involved in some of this, particularly involved in purchasing things and implementing things. Uh, but a lot of the, the data that I'll provide later on in the talk uh, has come from, from my colleagues uh, who have very kindly uh, provided that data for me and given me their permission to use it. Uh, so just to, to highlight at the start, this is very much a group effort, uh, which is something that uh, hopefully we have wherever we work. Uh, so just before I get on to talking about that journey, I think uh, whenever we're sharing good practice, and hopefully I will be able to do some of that during the course of this talk, uh, it's always a good idea to give an idea of the structure that we have at a certain place to make sure that people are aware of, of the structure of, of that institution and how we've implemented this, um, uh, these sort of solutions in the environment that we are in. Uh, so I said I am a deputy head of department in the Department of Life Sciences, but that department is one of five departments uh, that sit in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Uh, the other departments are the Department of Natural Sciences, the Department of Sport and Exercise Sciences, we have Engineering, and we have Computing Maths and Digital Technology as well. Uh, on that slide there, I've got a, a number of programs that we run, a number of courses that we run in each of these different departments. It's certainly not an exhaustive list, but it might give an idea of the, the breadth of some of the content that we deliver. Uh, so in Life Sciences, I say where I am based, our main course is in Biomedical Science, at undergraduate level, uh, we have a human physiology course and we have human biosciences. And at the same time, we have some NHS commission programs to do with healthcare science as well. In natural sciences, we have biology, we have microbiology, molecular science. They also run chemistry and a few other courses from natural sciences. And in sport and exercise sciences, we have sport and exercise science being its main course and we have sports coaching as well. One of the reasons that I've highlighted those courses is because there is, in many cases, some overlap between the sort of activities that are done, particularly from a laboratory point of view, across those three departments. We don't share any units, we don't co-teach any of them, but we deliver similar content. So, for example, physiology, which is my background, is delivered in human physiology, human bioscience and biomedical science, uh, but it's also, to a lesser degree, um, delivered in biology and in sport and exercise science as well. Similarly, we run microbiology units and modules in biomedical science, as they do in microbiology and molecular science, uh, and cell and molecular biology as well. So the point of that being that we have a lot of students who are studying different, uh, different su subjects in different departments, but ultimately that cover some similar content and therefore had the same sort of challenges uh, as a result of the pandemic. Focusing specifically in the Department of Life Science now, where I say I come from, in terms of student numbers on these, biomedical science, uh, we might, on a, on a normal year, expect around 240, 250 students to, to come onto the first year of that programme. Between the human physiology and human biosciences programmes, we, we might expect another 50 or 60. And our healthcare science programmes are a bit smaller with 20 odd students on those. So across the department at undergraduate level, we may have around and about 300 to 340 students a year. 
We also have an additional thing to consider with our programs in life sciences, which is we have accreditation from uh, two external bodies for our biomedical science program. That accreditation is from the Institute of Biomedical Science, which here in the UK uh, is an important part of, of being able to work in the NHS. Uh, so one part of requiring to, to work in a hospital lab in the NHS is to have an IBMS accredited biomedical science degree. Uh, so we have to meet certain requirements from that biomedical science course uh, in order to, to have that accreditation. Similarly, our biomedical science, human physiology and human biosciences programs are all accredited by the Royal Society of Biology as well. And one of the key aspects of the Royal Society of Biology accreditation is that we assess for skills competency. In other words, what we're interested in is that a student who is studying a science-based program will be in a laboratory and at some point during the course of their degree, we can show and demonstrate that those students are able to undertake certain laboratory skills. That could be as straightforward as using a pipette, it could be doing an ECG, or it could be doing something a little bit more uh, advanced like QPCR or, or something of that nature. Now, prior to, to this academic year, the way that we did that was we had learning outcomes as part of each of the units that students would study, uh, which involved assessing for skills competency. From this year onwards, we started bringing in a non-credit bearing unit, which basically involves assessing technical skills. Uh, and that, that unit, say, is non-credit bearing, but ultimately has to be passed by students in order to gain the degree title that they have signed up for. So we have quite a large number of students. We have a range of programs uh, and we have our external accreditations. In terms of the environment that we currently work in, this is uh, a picture of our physiology labs. Uh, it's fairly sort of basic physiology lab. It is at the moment a temporary lab, but it's still a pretty decent laboratory. You can see there we've got lots of computers, we've got some power labs, uh, and we've got some fairly basic physiology equipment. On the other side of that, uh, of that corridor, we have another physiology lab, which we use largely for um, whole body type physiology experiments where we might get people doing some exercise and take some messages, uh, take, some, uh, take some measurements from them. Uh, but ultimately, we, we have fairly good, but largely um, fairly, fairly normal physiology lab facilities. We also have cell and molecular labs and we have microbiology, microbiology labs, which on a similar sort of situation, we've got lots of benches, we've got lots of microscopes, and we've got lots of equipment that, that students can play with. We, one of the things that has been very good about, um, about working in this faculty for the last 15 years is that we are actually very good at buying equipment for students to use. So here's an example of that. We have uh, our virtual dissection table in the middle of the lab there. So I say that is our little physiology lab, which sometimes doubles as a as a, a media studio. So this was actually used uh, for a TV series recently. Um, that anatomized table is, is there as a virtual dissection table, which allows us to, to help with teaching anatomy. We can cut up um, cadavers on that and then just ultimately undo various cuts that we do instead of ruining samples that we might get from, from a, a hospital or, or something along those lines. A very nice bit of equipment, which we've had for a number of years. We have, we have two of them. We also have patient simulators so that we can simulate various disease states. Obviously, a lot of what we do in lectures is talking about disease, but when we come into a laboratory environment, particularly with physiology, we tend to do lots of experiments on healthy 18 to 22-year-old students. Uh, so we bought our patient simulators a number of years ago to try and simulate those disease cases uh, so that students could at least get some experience of dealing or, or looking at certain measurements from those disease cases. So that's the situation as, as we were in uh, before the pandemic struck. So to summarise that, um, from an equipment point of view, from an AD Instruments point of view, we've had power labs uh, for around and about 30 years or there and thereabouts. And some of those power labs were indeed about 30 years old. We've, we purchased a lot of technology to try and improve student uh, engagement and student motivation throughout the years. And we've got a long history of doing that. But if I'm being perfectly honest, that use that we had for a period of time was fairly basic. We had access to these things. We had access to lab tutor. We had access to anatomized tables and patient simulators. But we didn't use them to their full potential in any way whatsoever. Because uh, if we're being perfectly honest, we never really needed to. Ultimately, we were doing very well. We had good student satisfaction. We had lots of students. Everyone seemed to be doing very well. So there was no particular drive to make sure that we did a lot of research uh, from a pedagogy point of view. There was no particular drive to develop lots and lots of, of new teaching materials where we all had other things to be doing. So 
if I was to summarize the past, it would say that we had an awful lot of potential, but it was never fully realized. Now, without wanting to bring back too many horrible memories uh, for anybody who was teaching during the pandemic, um, ultimately in March 2020, um, we went into a rather strange time, shall we say, when it comes to higher education. And from our point of view, and again, this will be similar to a lot of people, but it might be quite different to some others, we had a, a huge number of challenges in the Department of Life Sciences. The first of those was that despite everybody thinking that student numbers would go down in, uh, in that particular academic year, our student numbers actually went up. So I said earlier, we might expect somewhere between 300 to 320 odd students a year. In uh, the 2020-21 academic year, uh, we had 430 students enroll in our undergraduate programs. Um, in addition to that increased number of students, uh, because of social distancing and the room capacity sizes and various other issues of that nature, we were teaching students in groups of 13 to 16 with that very, very large intake of students that year. So if we do some basic maths on that, a physiology practical um, with a group of 15 students uh, with an intake of 400 odd students in a year meant that we were repeating that practical 27 times, which was quite a lot and led to its own uh, number of challenges. We then, particularly in the northwest of England, had our, our local lockdowns where maybe we, uh, we were told that this, this particular part of the country weren't allowed to, to go out of the house for a period of time. We had classes being flipped online, often at very, very short notice, in some cases with an hour's notice because there had been a case of COVID within that group and we had to, to isolate people. From a staff perspective, we had staff unavailable due to either having COVID or some other illness or because they had pre-existing conditions, which meant that they were unable to come on campus. And we also, from a physiology perspective, have a, a quite specific issue to do with social distancing, which is that in human physiology practicals, we tend to take measurements from other people. So by definition, you have to be quite near them. If I'm doing an ECG, for example, on somebody, I need to be close enough to them to stick the ECG electrodes on them. Uh, and obviously, in cases of social distancing, where we weren't allowed outside a certain box, which was put on tape on the, on the floor, that wasn't possible. We also had some other bigger challenges, which I'm sure everybody else had as well, which is this growth of, of what is now termed asynchronous activity. Now, obviously, as part of higher education, we've been providing lots of directed learning to students for, for years. Um, however, this idea that because we had lower amounts of time on campus, we needed to increase the amount of this asynchronous activity certainly led to a lot of issues because we had to develop things. We had to, to ultimately make sure that that was available to students at an appropriate time. With regard to our, our accreditations, we still need to assess for competency for the learning outcomes of those units during, during lockdown. We were very lucky when it comes to the Royal Society of Biology and, um, uh, and uh, Institute of Biomedical Science that they obviously understood the, the issues that we had. And they were happy for us to assess that competency in a different way for that academic year. In addition to that, because a lot of stuff was getting done online during this period of time, you've got rapid digital upskilling of staff and students to make sure that we can use resources that we brought into, but also make sure that we provide as good as, uh, experience for students as possible. So like everybody, we had lots of challenges and some of those will have been specific to us. Some will have been uh, very general and everybody will have uh, experienced it at some point. So in response to those challenges that we had, we, we obviously had to come up with a solution. And, and ultimately, our solution was to invest uh, and invest very heavily in virtual solutions. Uh, and we did that from a laboratory point of view in three different ways. We, we basically bought into three separate packages. The first was uh, linked to, to AD Instruments LT. Let's say we've been using Power Labs here for, for 30 odd years with Lab Tutor, but we'd never really got too involved with the online side of things at NLT. And suddenly we were uh, buying lots of licenses and making heavy, heavy use of, of LT during the pandemic. One of the benefits of, of LT, and if you've not seen what this is like, I've, I've got a short video on the next slide, which hopefully can show you how this works, um, is ultimately it ensures very consistent delivery uh, for groups of students. So what you have is a situation where you have a practical that's already written for you. Um, you can edit it as much as you want, of course, but ultimately you have a practical which is written that students just work through ultimately in their own time. Now, for me, as, as a line manager these days, if I've got people who are unable to come on campus or I've got a physiology practical and, I, and for some reason I can't get any physiology staff to deliver that practical, it means that anybody can ultimately come into that situation 
uh, and oversee what's being done without having to have much subject specific knowledge. One of the other good things about LT is that it comes with example data. So when we were in local lockdowns or in lockdown, uh, complete lockdown rather, uh, we couldn't come onto campus and do any of the experiments that, that LT uh, is ultimately designed to run with. You can use that example data to make sure that students go through the practical, they at least get to analyze that data, they get to understand what that data collection looks like, and they get to draw conclusions from it as you otherwise would. Similarly, um, it's something that they can do on their own. They can either do that at home, uh, if that example data is available, or they can do it in a laboratory class, either on their own or, or as part of a group. We also invested in the Understand Your Physiology section of, of LT. So most of LT, if you're not aware, is about those lab classes and it's about doing data collection. However, Understand Your Physiology is more just about access to general physiology um, textbooks, <laughs> textbooks sort of level, um, level information effectively. Uh, so you can set various tasks for students as part of the Understand Your Physiology module, uh, which ultimately we, we use for asynchronous activity. So again, instead of starting from scratch and getting staff to, to write their own things, we used what is a high quality resource to make sure that staff were spending their time doing, doing other stuff. And similarly, uh, from a competency, from a learning outcomes point of view, the professional bodies were, were, were happy for us to use this as a resource to, to ultimately assess understanding and to a certain extent competency in doing a certain technique. We had to couple that with ultimately getting students onto campus as quickly as possible and running catch-up lab sessions when we could. But ultimately, this solution allowed us to assess understanding and competency um, reasonably easily. So for those who, who haven't seen it, um, or are not quite aware of how LT worked, it's a very short video of, um, of how LT works. You have very, very clear backgrounds and procedures. You've got some example data there that's being highlighted. Uh, the procedure there shows students exactly how they would collect that data or how they are going to collect that data if you're in a laboratory. You collect the data, in this case, for ECG and pulse. We can then move on to the next section, which is an analysis section, and ultimately the, uh, the instructions are there so that students can do that in their own time, stick their hand up if they've got any questions or they're not sure what to do. But ultimately, at the end of this, there's some questions to assess their understanding, and they can submit that ultimately. Um, as part of an assessment or part of, in our case, for, for competencies. So in addition to investing in LT, we also invested in other virtual solutions, uh, one of which is Labster. Uh, so Labster, if you're not aware of what this is, is ultimately it's a computer simulation uh, of various types of, of wet lab experiments. And uh, the way I like to explain this, again, I've got another video on the next slide, but the way I like to explain this is it's sort of like SimCity. Uh, if you've ever played anything like that on a computer. It's very computer game-ish. It's not quite as scientific or physiological necessarily as, as LT is, uh, but it's an engaging way for students to wander around the lab. Uh, so the idea behind this is it's a linear experience, but ultimately students can press on certain areas uh, of, of the screen and somebody in the lab will move towards that environment. You can pick up test tubes and put them in a flow cytometer or, or some other uh, experiment that, that's being undertaken. You can collect some data from that so that, again, students can complete a few questions and show that they've gone through that process. That, the, most of those simulations last around 30 or, or 40 minutes. And again, you can do them on your own. You can do them as many times as you wish or once if you want to assess somebody using that particular um, experience. So again, if you've not seen it, uh, this is an example uh, of Labster. Uh, it's a video where somebody's analyzing some samples uh, to do with um, DNA, I believe here. So we've got a test tube, which again, you just walk through uh, by pressing on the various sections of um, of the screen, stick it through, in this case, a, a fluorescent probe, I believe. And from this, you're gonna get some data, which uh, can then draw some figures. There'll be some questions to answer and students are supposed to be able to understand what's undertaken during that simulation. So in addition to, to LT and, and Labster, we also invested in um, 
another resource called Learning Science, which I'm afraid I don't have a video for you. But it's a similar sort of idea, focusing very much on wet lab skills. So this was used more by natural sciences than, than life sciences. Uh, and it's far more about individual techniques. Uh, it doesn't look quite as computer gameish as Labster. There's not quite as much in terms of, um, of reports that you generate as an LT. But it's a very interactive resource, which again just highlights the uh, the range of things that we do across the faculty and make sure that almost all subjects will have had something that they can engage in from a virtual point of view. So that got us through that academic year and through that, that rather horrendous um, uh, part of teaching during the pandemic. And then we, we eventually got told, right, we're going to return to what we're, I'm quoting here as normal. Um, and at that point, we were told that we could come back on campus, we should be teaching as normal. Uh, or as pre-pandemic levels as, as possible. And when we looked at, at how we wanted to do things moving forward, there were a few things that we needed to, to consider and ultimately decided to do. The first was that while we invested in LT and Labster and in learning science uh, as a very reactionary type thing to a very specific situation, we were going to continue investing in those. And importantly, rather than having one-year licenses for those, we've ended up with three-year licenses so that we can not just look at what we're going to do now, but how we can build these things into part of our normal curriculum uh, and how ultimately students can develop over time using these resources. That also added the added benefit that in summer 2021, we had no idea what was actually going to happen when it came to COVID. So things like local lockdowns meant that we still had those resources if we, need, if we needed it. But we moved very much from being reactive to being proactive and thinking, right, if we can actually have students back on campus, if we can have students in a laboratory doing practicals, how are we going to use these virtual resources moving forward? How do we want this to be part of our curriculum? So instead of replacing lab classes, as was the case in 2020-21, now what we were trying to do was use these resources to prepare students before they turn up to a laboratory. So say, for example, we're doing a qPCR practical in, in uh, techniques and applications in biomedical science. The idea is that we might give somebody uh, a lab start to do beforehand so that they understand how this process is done. They understand the, the general idea of what things are done in what order and what data is going to come out of the analyzer at the end of it. So that when they turn up in the laboratory, they've at least had a shot at doing it. It's not starting. Um, it's not starting from scratch effectively in that first few minutes that they turn up in a lab. Similarly, we're still encouraging the use of Understand Your Physiology. It is an excellent resource. Um, so why we would put, why we produce our own stuff when we have act, uh, we have access to that uh, is an interesting question and, and one that certainly we use uh, fairly regularly. Um, from a physiology perspective, we certainly expanded our use of LT. But I think importantly, um, we don't use this in all physiology lab classes. One of the, the key bits of feedback we got from students is that they like variety. They don't just like always having to walk into a physiology lab, log into LT, work through a worksheet and get some data and then walk out again. They like, they like different things. So while we make heavy use of LT for a lot of what we do, we don't use it for absolutely everything. So we've got that, that variety and hopefully students appreciate that. Again, moving from, from virtual labs as being a, a replacement for what we would otherwise do in a lab during a pandemic, now we focus more on virtual labs for revision we use that example data. If students have only got a limited amount of time in a laboratory, then they can do these sort of activities to help remind themselves of what they would have done or have done during that lab class. So that was our return to normal. And, and on, for the rest of this presentation, I want to focus on, on the future, because uh, obviously we've been through an awful lot there over the course of, of a few years, uh, going from fairly basic use of, of technology to being heavily reliant on lots of virtual resources. And this is where I'm going to try and turn the pandemic into a positive, if that's even, pos uh, if that's even possible. Because as a result of, of the, the things that we've learned throughout that process, that has taken us into our next stage of where we're going as, as a faculty and as a department. And I say that because at this point, uh, we're in the process of building a new building on the site of the one I am currently in, in Manchester. And this is a picture of what it's supposed to look like uh, when we move into it in September of, of this year. And just to highlight um, what that is going to be like, I've got another little video here, uh, which lasts a minute or so, which just highlights what this is going to look like. And ultimately, hopefully, you can see how it will be a little bit different from how we've done things in, in the past.
step into the future of science and engineering. Our £115 million campus redevelopment is at the heart of Manchester Metropolitan University's bustling campus. Where you can collaborate with students, staff and industry partners on innovative projects. Explore exciting possibilities inside interdisciplinary teaching and research spaces. We're transforming the way you learn providing you with opportunities to work on projects suggested by industry partners. So you can develop the skills you need to help solve real world problems. Work with students across a range of subjects, from biology and computing, to environmental science and engineering, to address the challenges of today in our 200 capacity super lab. Experience modern facilities, use world-class equipment, and learn from experts. This is more than just a building. It's a space to fly. Now it's your time to step into the future of science and engineering at Manchester Met. Hopefully that, that gives a, a, an idea of what we're, we're looking at. So it's a very exciting time for us here. Uh, we're all, all very interested in it. I've been working at MMU for 15 years, uh, and I believe that the first few weeks that I turned up here, we were starting talking about a new building, and it's finally here. Um, I say in, in a few months' time, we're actually going to be, be in there and teaching from there. That's, a, that's very exciting because as, as we're a part of the planning process for this, I've been involved in a lot of meetings when it comes to the planning of that new building. And I can say from experience that students have been thought of from the start of that of that process. The whole building has been put together with how we want to teach students over the course of the next five to ten years in mind. In relation to that, and you'll have seen in some of those pictures, this is a still picture of how they envisage one of the teaching uh, rooms in, in the new building, the Dalton building as, it, as it's called. Um, there's not going to be any lecture theatres in there. We will still have access to some lecture theatres in other buildings. But the teaching spaces are going to be active learning spaces, which can either be for 50 students up to 200 students. And the idea is that in these spaces, students are doing things. This idea of didactic teaching and just talking at people for a while um, is really something that we want to put in the past. You'll have also heard in that video that they have a 200 seater super lab. So instead of that, those pictures I showed earlier on of the temporary physiology labs where we might have 40 or 50 students in there at any one go, and repeating a practical five, six, seven times in order to get a cohort through. The idea is that we'll do that in one shot uh, in this new building, maybe two deliveries if we've got a particularly large unit. Um, so the way that we are going to be teaching people in the course of the next uh, few months is going to change quite, dr quite drastically. And in many ways, uh, some of the things that we've done, that we've learned through the pandemic will help us in that, and I, I very much be believe that. So again, in not too distant future then, say we will be teaching very differently here. We're still going to have high student numbers. That's not going to change. We're still going to have our 350, 400 student intakes every undergraduate year. We're still going to be assessing technical skills more so actually than, than it we ever have. And there's going to be far more focus on small group activity and active learning than there ever has been in the past. There's still going to be lots of asynchronous activity. There's still going to be lots of directed learning. So we're still going to have to be using things like understand your, your physiology. And I see there's a question in the chat there about that, uh, which hopefully uh, we, we can address later on. Um, technology is going to be a big part of that, both both in terms of what we have purchased already and what I'll, I'll come on and show you again in a, in a few slides time, uh, but also in terms of how those spaces are set up and how students can interact with, with uh, lecturers, how students can interact with each other, how they can present things and so on uh, in teaching spaces. And so we have that, that super lab, which comes with loads and loads of possibilities. It should help the staff time. It should help with the experience that students get working in a big community. But that doesn't mean that there won't be challenges. And some of those will be to do with time and facilities pressures. Uh, because at the same time as running physiology practicals in there, we'll also be running cell and molecular practicals and microbiology practicals and, and a whole host of other things, uh, which ultimately will we'll need ironing out over a period of time. So it's a very exciting time 
uh, which which again leads to some challenges. But hopefully, I say we're we're more equipped to to deal with those now than we ever have been. And one of the things that, that we've done is we've continued our investment in, in technology to help with this. So a few slides back, right at the start of this, I showed an example of the anatomized table. Uh, we've bought some more of those. Um, we've upgraded those uh, to try and, again, make sure that when we're in that super lab environment, if, uh, if we've got 200 students in there, but we've only got one or two anatomized tables, they're not going to be particularly useful uh, simply because of the number of students you can, can put around them at any one time. So we bought some more of them. We've got the latest versions of them, which can stand up. Uh, so that more students can see what's going on and more students can play with them, etc. But we've also bought portable versions of them as well. So these are anatomized uh, tablets, um, which are scaled down versions of those virtual dissection table, uh, which are effectively the size of, of an iPad or, or a Samsung tablet. Uh, and what this means is that I don't have to do this sort of activity in the laboratory. You know, those tables, uh, those, those full anatomized tables are fantastic. They really are. They're a fantastic resource but they don't move around the building particularly easily. Uh, whereas those tablets, I can take to any one of those active learning spaces and I can do something that I was gonna do in a laboratory-based environment in that active learning space. Um, it doesn't have quite the same functionality, but it certainly has enough to make sure uh, that the experience that students can get from playing with those, those particular bits of technology uh, helps with their learning. Um, say we, we've continued investing in power labs. We just bought uh, 20 more of those, I think it was. We bought brand new uh, cycle equipment for, for human physiology type experiments, really investing heavily in making sure that students have access to the best equipment and enough equipment so that we can, um, we can, we can work properly out of that super lab environment. Uh, similarly, we've bought here some, some pharmacology rigs when, at a time when a lot of places are reducing the amount of pharmacology that they're doing. Uh, as part of our uh, investment, we've made sure that we, we have access to the best equipment available uh, to make sure that students who need that experience will get that experience um, over the course of their degrees. And again, continuing this idea of being a little bit more portable around the building and potentially not necessarily requiring um, to be in a laboratory to, to run any sort of data acquisition, we've, we've invested in LT sensors as well which again, if you're not aware of what these are, they're effectively little mobile power labs, uh, which um, communicate with, with LT uh, through USB dongles. You can see here, we've got a couple of pictures of, of doing an ECG on a laptop. Um, so the idea behind buying these is that if I can't get access to that super lab, or I think there's a nice activity that I can do as part of this active learning space that I've got booked, then I don't have to try and move a power lab with me because that's difficult. I can go and pick up these USB um, uh, USB sensors, I can get my laptops that I can get moved in by technical services. And instead of sitting there and doing a 1A4 sheet of paper and just talking about something, I can get people to collect some data. I can play around with that data. I can use that to make a point and hopefully be that little bit more exciting than, than it might have been in the past. That's not just in relation to physiology, though. We've also looked at microbiology as well. So on the right-hand side of this picture, you've got a very fancy mic teaching microscope, which is in our microbiology lab and we'll be in our super lab. Uh, but we've also invested in a pile of more portable uh, microscopes on the left-hand side, which means, again, if it's allowed through a health and safety point of view, so I've fixed some slides in a lab, for example, then I can take those along to one of those active learning spaces and we can look down microscopes. We can get students doing the interesting stuff of looking at images, looking at data, using that to try and understand concepts that we've delivered during a lecture or, or in some online environment to try and enhance their experience as much as possible. So again, we've, we've tried to, to invest an awful lot of money planning uh, on how we're going to teach in this, this new building. Uh, so this is how I guess we see things moving uh, in the next few months. We'll be continuing using LT without any shadow of a doubt and all those other online resources. That allows us that, uh, that freedom of doing things um, in an hopefully exciting and interesting manner. We can do that in a mul multiple different environments with those LT sensors. And hopefully that helps with time and staff and pressures as well. Um, so that obviously anybody working in higher education will realize there's a lot of time and staff and pressures. And hopefully this investment will, will help us free some of that, that staff time up so they can do research or they can, um, or, or they can generate other learning materials or whatever it might be that they wish to do. But ultimately, the key part of all these things that we've invested in is that they're high quality resources. 
Uh, they're all very, very good, very interesting, very engaging, very interactive, so that students have a good experience with us and hopefully backs up the learning that we, we provided them in lectures and, and other content. But again, I think one of the most important things that for us moving forward into this new building, this new space, is that it doesn't, these solutions mean we don't always require access to a lab. Hopefully we get students into that lab as often as possible. It's a key part uh, of any science degree. And it's, it's important that we make sure that students are exposed to that lab environment as much as possible. But we can also use other spaces where we can collect data from certain types of experiments or certain subjects uh, to, to make sure that we're exposing students to, to as much of that information as possible. So that from a technology point of view is, um, uh, is what we've invested in. We've got some data to, to suggest um, that, that students quite like that as well, which is good. So this is an example uh, from one of my colleagues, Dr. Lloyd Orton, um, specifically focusing on the LT sensors. So a very small group of students, because I should point out through the next few slides, all of these examples and the data that I provide here are based on relatively small cohorts because we've been trying this in small groups uh, and aiming to scale that up into bigger units and, um, and larger student numbers as we move into the new building. Uh, but this is a particular uh, survey that Lloyd did uh, when, when students had used the LT sensors and comparing them to the power labs. As you can see there, finding LT sensors easy to use. You've got everyone saying strongly agree or agree, which is great. Uh, high quality piece of scientific equipment, almost everyone uh, agreeing with that. And in terms of preferring using LT sensors to power labs, that's a pretty decent um, decent spread of numbers there as well for sensors and power labs in general. But more importantly, maybe some of the comments on, on the bottom there, let us know what you liked about the practical. It was fun. You know, we're all scientists. We're all educators. We want students to enjoy what we do. Uh, so when you get feedback saying it was fun, that's obviously uh, something that, that, that we like to, to hear. Similarly, interactive and fun to do. That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, the flow of practical and explanation, easy to understand. That's always good as well. Instructions were clear. Again, this is an LT. Uh, practical wasn't tedious, which is definitely good to know. Um, it was informative. It was enjoyable. Those are the sort of things that, that we're aiming for. And certainly from this small group of students, it seems like we're, we're hitting the right spot there. Um, just moving on to some other uh, examples. And, and the, the point of these last few slides is just to highlight how we've gone from, from where we were right at the start of this presentation, where I say we had access to a whole bunch of things but weren't particularly getting too innovative in what we were doing. Uh, we've moved completely now into a situation where we've invested in stuff, we've got access to loads of equipment, and we have staff really invested in, in making use of that equipment and making uh, the experience even better for students than it was previously. This is an example uh, of, of an activity that uh, my colleague Liam Bagley, who you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, um, helped to put together uh, earlier this academic year. So this was done in, in the end of January, I believe, if, uh, if I'm right. It was a whole department activity, uh, which was ultimately supposed to be about employability and, and developing various uh, transferable skills like problem solving and so on. And what he did was he put together an escape room style activity. So on the right hand side there, you've got a box where you've got two other boxes with padlocks in them and QR codes and, and things of that nature. Uh, and he set up a, a little problem solving activity where students had to solve problems that got them the, the, the codes to get into the boxes, which ultimately got them to the solution of the problem. Uh, it was a whole big production that, that we put together. Um, and here, here's the, the start off of that escape room just to get your, your blood pressure going up a little bit first thing in, uh, uh, in the morning, if you happen to be in the morning. Oh, there you are. Finally, I've been ringing you for ages. I can't get through. I, I've been locked in the, in the, in the ward. I, I can't open any of the doors and um, the, you can't get in or out or anything like that. And I'm completely by myself. It's the patient in bed three. Um, I think they're having an MI. Um, and if we don't do something quick, they're going to go into cardiogenic shock. Um, I'm completely by myself and all the guidance documents and all the, all the treatment plans are locked away in the room with you uh, and all those boxes. So I need to get into them, but I can't get near them and you can't get in this lab. So what I need you to do is solve all the clues on that on the, on the, to get the passcodes and get the treatment plan and send me it in the room as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, I'm scared we're going to lose this patient. Um, send me them ASAP because I think they're going to they're going to crash any moment. I think we've got about an hour uh, before the before 
there's going to be serious issues here. Um, you need to work as a team to get these and work really fast, okay? Um, the first clues for the treatment plan, open the boxes, um, are in the envelope uh, right in front of you. And it says, open me on it. Um, start there and be quick. We don't have much time. I'll ring you in a bit. Cheers. I've got to go. Bye. So as you can see there, Liam's put a lot of effort into that. There's a lots of other people involved in this as well. Uh, but Liam certainly spearheaded this for us. Um, it was a great day. We had a great, a lot, lot of fun. Staff, students uh, enjoyed ourselves. Uh, and again, we got some feedback on that. And if you look at those numbers there on the right-hand side of that uh, that column, those are the sort of numbers that you're looking for. I think we can all uh, we, we can all agree. If 98.1% if of, of students who are applying to this say it's enjoyable, that makes me happy. Uh, similarly, developing problem-solving skills, the whole point of this, 99.1%. Developing team working skills, 99.1%. Uh, opportunity to meet other students and, and so on. That's um, uh, you know th that's the sort of feedback that, that we really are looking for. On a side note, Liam keeps telling me that uh, he's going to go and get a job in acting these days, but uh, I, I suspect he might not quite make it in that. Uh, Liam's another example here, though. Again, um, you know he's very very keen uh, on this sort of stuff. Um, over in another building in this institution, we have what's called the CAVE, uh, which is a, stands for something like Computer Augmented Virtual Environment or, or something of that nature. Ultimately, it's a room where you get projections on all the walls and the floor, uh, and all the, and the walls are, are touch sensitive, so you can get students pressing on on the walls to choose certain answers. And again, Liam, um, because he's, he's very, very keen on this sort of stuff, um, put together uh, in this case, a, a case study for one of his second year units uh, on altitude sickness. Uh, so he simulated this in the cave uh, where he put a whole package together where, where students had to work together to try and solve what was wrong with uh, with somebody in a, uh, when they went up to base camp in, in Everest. Um, as again, a, a quick example, and I'll do this very, very quickly because I know we're running out of time here. Uh, but this is a rough idea of how it all works where you've got the sound that's going all around you. In this case, yeah, you're simulating being on Everest, so it's very windy, it's very snowy, etc. People have added their voices to this. I did it myself, but he hasn't included it in the video for some reason. Um, and you can see here, uh, as you go through, um, what various scenarios that you might want to undertake. Um, various options are going to come up on the wall. Students have to work together to choose the right the right option, and then they just select that on the wall. What, what, what do you mean? I mean, he's, he's really ill. Like, like, are you not bothered? Like, I don't, I just, I don't understand. Um, okay, I mean, I guess we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on him. So again, another example of, of, of how, again, these are things that we, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that this is not something that we would have done a few years ago. Because of the, the journey that we've been through, People are more interested in getting involved in these things and, and ultimately producing these sort of resources. Again, we did some feedback on this. Um, Liam's uh, put this together. He submitted it to, to a conference here. Uh, and again, small numbers of students. Again, remember, we're, we're trying. We're going to scale this up over the course of the next few years. But again, those are the sort of numbers that we can all agree are pretty good uh, when it comes to student satisfaction and, and so on. 100% saying enjoyment, 100% on subject-specific knowledge, uh, how engaging it is. Um, ability to apply knowledge, things like that are exactly what we're looking for. And if you look at the word cloud there, mostly it's very good, motivated, enthusiastic, excited. But I guess it is probably worth noting that in those environments that you do actually pressurize students a little bit and you can make them a little bit nervous, which you could argue is a good thing uh, because that is ultimately what they will have to, to come up against when they, they leave university and move into a job. But it is something to, to be aware of uh, when developing these sort of things. And as a, a final example here, again, we have uh, colleagues over in the School of Digital yeah. Arts who are keen on virtual reality. Um, so this is a, an example of, of a study that was done very recently. I don't actually have the data for, but I'll, I'll give you a very brief overview of it, um, where one of our Declan Sai students who works in the NHS worked with uh, an external company to put together a virtual reality package. Uh, to, to basically teach students how to understand transfusion science. Uh, and as part of her Declan Sci project, uh, with the, the help of Dr. Lloyd Orton and Dr. Lisa Coulthway, uh, they assessed um, in a group of undergraduate students with no prior knowledge of that particular topic, 
uh, how much their, their knowledge had improved as a result of, of going through that virtual reality software. And, and pretty much all of them uh, said, again, that it was very enjoyable. Uh, it certainly improved their subject knowledge, uh, and it was something that they would want more of. So this is a project that's ongoing uh, that ultimately we'll, we'll look to try and enhance and, and bring into our new building moving forward. So uh, I guess to, to summarise my, my talk to, to finish today and before we start a Q&A, um, we have come a very long way very quickly. We've always been very lucky in this department, in this faculty, where, where we have support from faculty to buy things and to, to hopefully buy things that are very good for student engagement, and student motivation and student success. Um, however, as I said at the start, maybe we haven't used that to its full extent previously. The pandemic has moved us into this stage of, of having to do some of that, which a number of people are now using to integrate into delivery because we've seen just how useful and, and how good it can be. Uh, but again, we're still learning, uh, and this will be something that, that will, will be with us for a while. Some things will work, some things will not. Uh, some things will require too much staff time in order to, to make it something we can put in the curriculum. And some things will be very, very simple and very straightforward, which is very easy to put together, and students will uh, will react extremely well to it. One of my colleagues, for example, recently put together a card game uh, for a revision session, which went down extremely well with uh, with students. Didn't have to involve technology. It was just something a bit different. Um, that's all very, very good for us, simply because um, with this new building coming in this year, this active learning idea that's going to be an important part of our strategy moving forward, uh, maintaining, enhancing that student offer as we move into the next few years here at Manchester Met, it's going to to involve this sort of technology. Um, and ultimately, we feel far red, far more ready to deal with that now than we did a few years back. So thank you very much again for, for joining us this afternoon. More than happy to take any questions. And thanks again for the invite to come and talk today. Thank you so much, Gethin. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so many interesting videos you've included as well here. <laughs> And we had some great discussions going on in the chat panel. If you, I don't know if you had a moment to take a peek, <laughs> um, but yeah, we were all very impressed with the technology that you've implemented and the university has implemented. All right. Our first question um, from Wendy, I don't know if you can answer this one, but you might have some um, information. Is the Understand Your Physiology a resource that comes with LT or is that something different? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, somebody from ADI might want to um, explain exactly how it works, but it's certainly in the LT platform. Um, so whenever you purchase LT, you, you purchase a, a package. Um, and that, that we have, say, for example, the human physiology package. And we have the sensor package because we bought those LT sensors. Uh, another package you can you can invest in is understand your physiology and you access it through LT. Um, exactly where it comes from behind the scenes, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but um, but it's certainly something that, that you access through the same system as you would any of the other stuff. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure that uh, ADI can provide more context to that. Um, and they can either reach out to you directly or in the Q&A report that we'll have after the webinar. Um, our next question is, what do you see as the main challenges to implementing the initiatives you've outlined? Uh, scale, I think, is the, the, the key thing. Um, you know, see a lot of the things, particularly at the end that I've talked about there, uh, are in relatively small groups of students. You're talking in the case of the escape room, I think that was about 150-ish students we had in that. Um, the other ones are maybe more along 10, 20, 30 students that we've that we've done those activities with. If you've got a cohort of 300 students, then obviously that's a, a much bigger scale. So making sure that we can scale that up to those sort of numbers, certainly from a, a capacity point of view, we can. Uh, but whether or not you can... Uh, maintain the same level of um, of delivery uh, is, it will be our main challenge, I think. That makes sense. Yeah, I can't imagine in, I mean, certain courses, of course, are smaller class sizes, but for the, the you know, the larger courses, um, there could be several hundred students. Uh, that might be more difficult for sure to, um, to do something like that. But 
uh, generally, I think lab classes, um, usually it's smaller cohorts. So uh, I think that if I had any of those um, kind of fun activities, it would have been a lot more interesting uh, than just, you know, reading something in a book. <laughs> so I was really impressed by that. Um, our next question asks, uh, the data presented covers a relatively small number of students. So this kind of relates to what we were just saying. How do you think it would correspond to larger student numbers? Yeah, I say it, it does relate to that that last question. I say from a capacity point of view, we have the capacity to do that. We have the staffing to do that. That's that's not a problem. If you think about um, the time that's invested into putting some of those resources together, you only have to do it once, and then you deliver it across uh, multiple runs of, of something. So that's done as well. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that we'll have is, and, and certainly when we've introduced some of these technologies in the past, um, is because it is different, students take a little bit of, of time to start engaging in it. Um, particularly if it's optional. Um, you know, if you've stuck an assessment on the end of it, then obviously students are going to are going to take part in it because they, they want the marks that come with it. Um, but if this is an optional activity or an optional extra, then you know, because it's new, because they don't know what to expect, then, then sometimes that can be very difficult to get uh, the engagement that you need. Um, so I think in terms of how we scale this up, a lot of it will be about how we go about using that in assessment, but also trying to make sure that it becomes normal uh, and it becomes something that isn't just a random one-off quirky type thing that's done. Uh, it's uh, the way that we teach ultimately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was going to ask whether uh, you have done those um, types of things again, or if it was it was for now a one-off, and maybe when you move in the new building, if, if a, a lot of those are a lot of those are one-offs because they've been yeah. done this year. Um, They're um, more new. <laughs> yeah, so they, they are more new, but certainly, say from that feedback, you know, if you're getting 100 percent students saying that they're happy with things, that you know, that, that that's not very normal. Um, so. We're, we're certainly we're already putting together a bunch of stuff for for next year. Um, certainly, with that new building in mind, we've got the capacity to do it and the technology to do it in there, uh, rather than this current building, which is a seventies building in the UK. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it, this building is, is as you would think of as a, an old college, effectively. There's lots of little square rooms uh, with with tables in them. Uh, which isn't what we're going to have in that new place, which will allow a little bit more of this interactivity to, to take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that you did gather feedback from the students um, and listen to them and their comments. So if if it hadn't worked out and it was a flop, then you know to not do it again. <laughs> but I think, yeah, 99, 100%, um, you know, positive interactions is amazing. Um Let's squeeze in one last question before um, we finish off today. How do you find staff buy-in to these initiatives? Mixed, um, I think is, is the short answer. We, we have 80 people, 80 academics in this department. Uh, not all of them are going to get on board with these activities. That's absolutely fine in my eyes. You know, there's a lot of people that might say otherwise. Um, but I, I don't see the point in trying to persuade people uh, to try and do these, these sort of things. Um, you know, you're not going to get the enthusiasm from it. Uh, you're, you're not going to get um, uh, th that that sort of um, educator student type interaction that you're looking for. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with with delivering lectures if that's what uh, people want to do. There's a good lecture is is a good lecture. Yep. Uh, I think what we're aiming for moving forward isn't moving everything to this sort of activity. It's not moving everything to to small groups. It's not getting rid of traditional didactic lectures. It's about introducing some more different ways of learning. So instead of turning up and, and expecting 12 hours of contact a week with, with eight of those being sitting in a lecture theatre with someone talking at you, maybe there's less of that and more of the other stuff so that the lectures are actually really interesting, really engaging. Staff aren't delivering those lectures over and over and over again so that they're enthusiastic when they're doing it. Um, so that we get this more blended approach to, uh, to how we teach students. Uh, and, and hopefully everyone enjoys that, which is what we're looking for. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. 
and uh, I have to agree with Wendy's comment that students are lucky you're making this stuff happen. Um, so I think that's amazing and keep, keep working at it. Um, so yeah, I think that will be the last question. We've reached the top of the hour. So I just wanna say thank you so much for being here and for your uh, time and expertise. It was really a pleasure to have you with us and I hope you had fun and I hope that the audience enjoyed it as well. You too. Thank you very much for having me. In closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar sponsored by AD Instruments. Um, all webinars in this four-part series are available to watch on demand, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.